Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, to our annual Don Mkwanazi um, Shama Se lecture on the 29th of July 2021 um, in the leadership month. Um, I want to begin by welcoming the Kwanazi family and welcoming uh, the chairperson of KwaZulu Natal uh, from the province for BMF, the president of BMF. And Lala, uh, the deputy president of BMF, the leadership as a whole, the members of the committee from the provincial committee of KwaZulu Natal, which are here, and uh, the members of the BMF at national uh, as a whole. Uh, the stalwarts of PMF, the PMF family, uh, I would like to welcome you. Uh, and also the speakers which we are having today uh, in the running order uh, without wasting time because we the time is of essence. Um, I would like to say today, as we are here to hear the annual Donim Kwanaz lecture, I think it is very, very important mm -hmm. for us, more especially the KZN people, and also from what we heard from the leadership, which just spoke, uh, the friend and the brother uh, who has pose some challenge to us by saying that he's considering us as leaders uh, and also as a caring leaders and also ethical leaders in terms of the value system. And also to ensure that uh, as we're facing this pandemic, which is not just pandemic in Gauteng and KwaZulu-Natal, but it's a national pandemic, it's a continental pandemic, it's an international pandemic. So, but we are lucky to have uh, this kind of engagement today as a PMF. Um, we also facing the issues of unemployment. We know what happened in Gauteng and also KwaZulu-Natal, but uh, we need just to stay firm and also uh, ensure that we create opportunities and share. We know that there's issues as the speaker has mentioned the issue of corruption. Um, I would like to, without wasting time, um, call upon uh, Ms. Farah uh, Ali to give the words of welcoming remarks, who is the chairperson of Thank you very much. Thank you, program director. I hope I'm clear. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Farah Ali, and in my capacity as the KwaZulu Natal Provincial Chair, on behalf of the BMF and the BMF KZN province, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to you all on this the sixth annual Don Kwanazi Lecture. It gives me immense pleasure to acknowledge the Mkwanazi family, our president, Andile Nomlala, keynote speaker, Cindy Mabaso Koyana, my fellow BMF board members, the KZN Provincial Committee members, past presidents, stalwarts of the BMF, our valued BMF members, and our trusted friends of the BMF for your presence this evening. July is an important month for the BMF and a highlight in the calendar of the KZN province as we gather to remember, 
honor and celebrate the life and contributions of a Durban legend and a South African icon who is Dr. Don Kwanazi. Lectures such as these allow us the time to pause, take a moment and reflect on the impactful and significant contributions of the leaders who came before us. A legend is someone who leaves behind an unforgettable impression on others. They touch lives, they are remembered, they are cherished. Becoming a legend means finding your particular role, your calling, following it and touching others around you. Bradon, as he was affectionately known, this is his impact. He was passionate about mentoring the youth and made sure that young and upcoming businessmen and businesswomen were adequately skilled. He pushed for empowerment. He made a significant commitment to youth and social development. He was passionate about entrepreneurship. He believed that entrepreneurship is a necessary risk that our people must be prepared to take because it creates jobs and therefore reduces poverty. An icon who has long been recognized as the father of black economic empowerment, his commitment to BEE was relentless. He stood for BEE when it was least fashionable to do so. He set a very high standard for leadership, commitment and sacrifice. He left behind a legacy of selfless business leadership and a pioneering spirit. Once again, I want to welcome everyone. And I know that you are looking forward to the keynote address as much as I am. So as I close, I want to read a part of one of Bradon's speeches. I quote, each one of us has a critical role to play in advancing the cause of economic revolution. Each one of us has a role in creating a better future for all. The future belongs to those who shape it. The future belongs to those who define it. Our future is in our hands, unquote. I thank you and I wish you a pleasant evening further. Program director, I'd like to hand back to you. Thank you very much uh, for uh, our chairperson for the warm welcome and also those in inspirational words. Um, probably, I'm still audible. Hello? Yes, yes, program okay. director. We can hear you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs> in fact, I forgot to introduce myself because I was looking at the time. Uh, my name is Bokang Molefe. Uh, I'm the member of the PMF in KZN. Um, uh, you, you, you spoke and you touched a very, very important things there, Farah, uh, in terms of that uh, Mr. Shama was the legend, was the icon, touching others, uh, mentoring the youth. Uh, he's also... Uh, contributed in terms of the triple PE. He had a commitment, he's a pioneer. So with those wise, wise words, uh, thank you very much, uh, Farah. I think uh, you, you did touch even myself as I'm sitting here. Um, I'm not sure whether you would want us to get a video or the first video was the first one. Should I, we should I introduce the should I introduce the host or the sponsor? Uh, can I just go through to introduce the sponsor, our sponsor today, uh, for the words of support uh, in terms of giving us something in terms of the video? Thank you very much. I'm Jismaine Bochenpul from the, the sponsor. And um, sorry for the technical glitch. On, on behalf of the African Women Chartered Accountants Investment Holdings Company that was established in 2008 as a broad-based investment company 
for black women to participate in. Um, we, we have around 55 African women shareholders, of which the majority are uh, chartered accountants. We're honored to uh, sponsor this important event. We, and the reason we are sponsoring it is because we see alignment between the, the uh, purpose and work of BMF and ourselves. Um, our, in, in essence, the alignment is around nurturing talent and, and black leadership with, with us as uh, AIH, it's our, the uh, abbreviated company name. We are nurturing African women chartered accountants. A portion of our profits goes to the African women chartered accountant association and, and it's used for bursaries and, and mentorship and leadership training of, of upcoming black women CAs. And likewise, BMF has a mandate around nurturing black professional leadership um, and, and black entrepreneurs. And with that um, alignment around our purpose and work also comes collaboration. And in the spirit of collaboration, our uh, co-founder and, and chairperson, Cindy mabaso Kiana will be doing the keynote address. And in that spirit of collaboration, I am, am, am pleased to currently serve as the deputy chairperson of BMF Investments Company. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jasmine. Um, sorry for the technical glitches. Um, we really appreciate as the BMF family to develop our African sisters as CAs, which is very, very scarce skill in terms of that. Uh, and also we really, really upload the great work which you are doing. And in terms of transformation and development, uh, would like to give you a, a round of applause in terms of that. Uh, that's, sorry, uh, <clears throat> we wish a good luck to our ladies and it's so important for us. Thank you very much, uh, Jasmine. Thank you. Um, I would like to proceed to the next uh, speaker. Um, uh, to, to invite our mm -hmm. president uh, to welcome uh, the president who is there in the shape of BMF uh, from time to time, guiding the leadership and ensuring that uh, some of us are mentored and lead us properly. Uh, I would like to welcome Mr. Andile Lomlala to uh, present. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Program Director. Uh, before I say anything, let me, on behalf of the BMF, extend our sincere and heartfelt condolences to the families of the people who lost their lives during the unprecedented looting violence in our country. And we also want to send our sincere word of condolences to the families that have been going through the hurricane and a very devastating uh, COVID pandemic those that have been directly affected and indirectly affected. I think our country is going through the most difficult period in its history. Before I, I, I proceed, I must firstly greet our keynote speaker, Mrs. Cindy Baba Sokoyan, and we say thank you for joining us uh, this evening. I must greet my deputy president, uh, Ms. Tazim Fredericks. She's always been a dependable soldier. I must greet my fellow colleagues in the board who have joined us. 
uh, more in particular the KZN leadership led by Farah Ali. And I see the luminaries of BMF amongst our midst, uh, our former deputy president, Meko Kokumalo. We greet you this evening. I see corporate uh, members of BMF uh, led by the executive chairman of uh, Greneka LTA, Mr. Clive Mangu. I see that the uh, Mafigam Kwanas, and without uh, further ado, I must, as we always do for many years, uh, say we are sincerely grateful to the Mkwanas family for always giving us this opportunity to gather together and remember our doyen and stalwart, Umpraton uh, Mkwanas. We greet you all, Siswe, and the rest of your family. We know that this is a second year in a row where we had to meet in these type of circumstances. We miss Deben, we miss your hospitality when we are there, uh, but we know that in future and in good time, things will be different. I must start my, my message tonight by saying that I'm thinking and I'm remembering what would Babu Don have said or could have said in these times. And there is a popular message that he shared back in the time old times of 1985, state of emergency and the uprising that was engulfing the country. Uh, he said back in those days that <clears throat> it was a, a precipitation or a precipit of, of the, era, the era and the history of their leadership to reimagine the BMF future. They couldn't continue in the manner and the path that they were leading the organization because they had to take a telling step. Back in those days, BMF was a apolitical uh, and a nonpartisan organization. But the, the, the times, the difficulty of the 1985 era had forced them to even go to Lusaka and go to London, in some instances, to go and engage the leadership of, of ANC. Because at that time, uh, things had to be done differently. The leadership from across all uh, forces in the country had to emerge. The UDF was there, the BMF was there, COSATU was there, and many other civil servant uh, movements were, were starting to, to take the fort and lead the struggle for emancipation of our people. And if you fast forward from that 1985 era, and you bring it to the crisis years that we have had uh, up to to date. We are almost called upon as the BMF family to take the reins and show leadership in some of the challenges that our country faces. And we can have courage to do so because we have seen our forebears taking responsibility rather than shying away. We have seen our forebears being at the cold face of facing the challenges that, that our country had at the time. And I think no one could have imagined that to date we would have almost 76% of our youth, physically abled bodies that are loitering the streets unemployed. Some of them are unemployable with a despicable record or a, disp a despicable uh, relationship with the education system that has produced them. Despicable in the sense that you are finding a situation in our country today that the average 55 year olds are more literate than the youth of our country. They are more skilled they can do much better jobs than a majority, and I mean millions and millions of our young people. 
in a country that is very youthful, in a country that is obviously operating in an ecosystem of a global environment where we are talking about knowledge-based economy, where the participation in the economy needs a highly technically skilled individuals to be able to find a piece of food for a day. We have an economy that has been structurally compromised by virtue of its foundation standing from the pillars of the apartheid era. And to break that structural composition of our economy, you would have expected that you would need a young mandarins of our country who are both highly educated and very dedicated individuals that would be able to firstly be entrepreneurs and be enterprising in the economy. And secondly, be the managers that would carry the governance of this country and would build a capable state and, and lay their hands and make sure that we have a functioning, progressive and proper, prosperous nation. Program director, we have the challenges that you know of and other people are seeming to be sidestepping them. Others are more fixated in diagnosing them and others are very happy to point them out, but they have nothing else to do or to contribute. In the BMF, we choose the different path. We choose not to point fingers because if we point one finger, the most chances are the four fingers will be pointing back at us. So in the BMF, we are very clear that the time is now that we need to converge as society from business to labor, civil society, government, and any other parties, even churches and, and the rest of the progressive forces in our country, we need to converge and think through an economic emergency uh, program. That emergency program would deal with firstly, trying to recover from the COVID crisis and the economic devastation of the last 10 years. And secondly, to rethink the processes and programs that could expand our economy aggressively and vigorously. And in the BMF, we call for the establishment of an economic recovery and expansion command council, similar to the COVID command council that we have. And what would that command council do? First of all, we have a devastation that has engulfed our country based on the crisis of COVID. The lockdowns that have brought, the lockdowns have brought immense strain into the already suffering and sacrificed black majority, particularly in the townships and the squatter camps where majority of our people live in. And we say that it's now the time that we can converge, look at the projects, go to all the spheres of government, go to all the private sector companies, look at the state-owned enterprises, look at the projects that can be implementable, whether infrastructure investment, expansion projects, any program that could yield job creation. And we see, what are the bottlenecks, particularly from the government point of view, where councillors and municipalities are wasting time from approving zoning plans, special planning plans, development plans, all of the stuff that can be unlocked tomorrow. And we then say, what could be fast-tracked tomorrow to create not 200,000 jobs. We need to look on a daily basis which strategic programs, projects, developments, even with you, Babu Clive Mani, which projects that have been, you have been approved as Greneca LTA 
which ones are being stalled by what? Is it a government inefficiency? Is it a funding inefficiency? Is it a structural uh, implementation program? And we then fast track those projects, bring them to the fore as in tomorrow. We're talking anything between one month and 12 months. And once you have that base, you would have created a critical mass of those investment projects and be able to quantify which, uh, what amount of jobs would be created. And we know colleagues that one black job or one African job amounts to feeding 15, 10 to 15 family members. Now the snowball effect of creating 2000 jobs, 10,000 jobs, 100,000 jobs, it will mean that we could at least escape a million people in no time out of poverty. Now, the question is, can we as business, as the professionals that we are, convene and look at what are the early imagined type of projects that we can put to the fore? And then we go to the second tier where we look at where is the capital that we need to direct? We look at how efficient are the DFIs in our country deploying their capital? What does ITC, NEF, CIFA, ECBIA funded PIC are deploying their capital? And which projects? And what are the delays? What is in their pipeline? And what in their pipeline could create jobs? And then we clear out any bottlenecks that are there. And to even to some extent, by the way, consolidate those DFIs so that there's a focus and there's efficiency, particularly when it comes to having multiple hundred offices and thousand of people, instead of you can't have an ITC who uses 40% of their balance sheet or their income to pay salaries, instead of using 90% of their money to deploy into black entrepreneurs. And then the third point, these are all emergents and these are all measures that could be implemented tomorrow. Then the third point would be, we look at the infrastructure projects, uh, infrastructure program that the government has been talking about. We're talking about 7 trillion plus uh, projects and we see which one, maybe just two that we can focus on and getting them off the ground. And we go to the private sector and we agree on terms, we structure, the projects and say, oh, okay, we don't have cash flow as government to implement these projects. But you as private sector, we employ you to bring the capital. We will then give you sovereign guarantees, we will then give you offtake agreements, we will then do anything that would limit our capital outflow as government, but at the same time would guarantee the investment returns for the investors. And I'm sure if we can converge and put our heads together, we could reach those goals. This idea of every day sitting and saying, we are dealing with the jobs, we are dealing with this, but there is no practical, well-defined implementation program is discouraging to our people. You would one suggest that there was insurrection, there were instigators, and for God forbid, I also believe there was such a thing. But what then becomes the issue of a mother who is carrying a child on her back, ducking rubber bullets, trying to loot a loaf of bread in a shop? Could you think that and could you suggest that that mother was coerced and was invited and was trained and was misled by somebody to do that? You certainly can't. Now, you can never ignore the poverty crisis we have. And frankly, as a Black professional who was served by the democratic dispensation, I fairly and firmly think that poor people have been fair and far nicer to us than necessary. The fact that they have now started the looting, I can tell you, and I don't wish it happens, but the uprising and the fatigue 
and people being fed up is coming. It's an inevitability. If we choose to ignore it, it will be at our own peril. But if we don't choose to ignore it, let's not fool the people. Let's go and say, these are the amount of jobs in these projects. And these are the people that will be appointed with these certain skills. The biasness will be on the graduates and the youth of our country. And even if those jobs are not the million that politicians tout every now and again out of nothing, at least people would have hope that one day a certain project is also going to come to our community and we'll be able to benefit and we'll be able to have jobs. Maybe and maybe only then they will have the patience to spare us from the squalor and the poverty that we have subjected them to live in. So in the Don Kwanazi lecture, Brad Don, how we used to call him, we know that Brad Don would have been very clear on the solutions of what needs to be done. And he would have been looking at us as the younger leadership of BMF. I had a conversation with Brad Don in 2016 when he said to me that, listen, Andil, this BMF now belongs to you guys. You must lead this organization with the decency and the dignity it deserves. And every day when we woke up, even though we know that we are leaders in our own right, we do everything in our power to preserve the name of Pradon Kwanazi's organization. We do that because we are indebted to their leadership we are indebted to the contribution that they have made in our country and will forever be indebted to the work that has propelled and created us to be the leaders that we are today. With those few words, I say to the family that we always, and for the many years to come, we will come and converge with you, break bread when it's necessary, but the era of our country now is damning. The era in our country now desire, requires, expect the leadership, the second layer leadership in our country to emerge and emerge to lead the country to prosperity. I thank you, uh, Program Director. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much uh, president you know you said mouthful you you in fact you, you were putting umkhabulo if i may say uh, you went as far as going everywhere in the corners of this country of south africa uh, with your wise words. Uh, that's why I was saying uh, as a leadership, uh, as a mentor, excellent leader, uh, we thank you. You, you, you. you spoke about, you touch base in terms of the turnaround times of the projects and you touch base in terms of performance whether it's private and public. Uh, you also spoke about redirecting the opportunities and the funds. You also spoke about infrastructure, which we need to ensure that uh, we tap into. Uh, you spoke about a lot of opportunities, which we need to ensure that we look at and we can be able to expose those uh, opportunities. You were also at the last very emotional, you know, uh, about what is happening around. So we need a contribution also as a BMF. And you also, spoke about that in BMF, we don't point fingers, but we need to ensure that we contribute as a progressive organization. 
we need to add value. So with those wise words, which you just mentioned, President, thank you very much. Uh, also on the chat, there are some wise words which are coming. Uh, probably without wasting time, let me take this opportunity to welcome and introduce our keynote speaker, uh, probably I'll read the profile is very rich, very long, uh, very challenging, very important. Uh, she is a, a chartered accountant by training. Cindy is an entrepreneur, corporate leader, and a champion for transformation who is held in high regard, both in South Africa and international. Um, she is the founder and executive chairperson of the African Women Chartered Accountants Investment Holdings, a woman owned and led investment company. Her illustrious career has included being managing director of Vimex Logistics, a subsidiary of Transnet Group Financial, director of Transnet, executive partner at East Nyang, amongst other things. Uh, she has served as a non-executive director of large corporates, including listed entities, where she has served and chair the audit and risk committees. Uh, these entities include the Public Investment Corporation of South Africa, Southern Africa Airways, Armament Corporation of South Africa, Spectrum LTD, South, Afri South African Institution of Chartered Accountants, FIFA, ESCOM, Artron Group, Artcorp Holdings, uh, among, other among others, um, her current board position include AWCA Investment Holding Pty Ltd, Toyota SA, MTN Group, Sun International Limited, Bidvest Group, uh, Pembani Group, South Africa Sugar Association of South Africa, Advance Group PT Pty Ltd, and Xenex Education Foundation. Cindy is the thought leader in the areas of finance, audit and risk management and ah, corporate ah. governance. Cindy is highly sought after as speaker on leadership, Africa's economic transformation and the role of women in business. Um, Sorry about that, in business. She has addressed audiences in South Africa and international, including Duke University, Artweb Management School, uh, Management Center of in, in Brack and, and, and Incent. She is well known for her role as a champion for advancement of women in business and corporate. Um, she played a key role in founding AWCA, African Women Chartered Accountants, an organization formed for development of African women chartered accountants. Within AWCA, she has played a vital role to bring the chartered accountant profession to young women from previous disadvantaged communities. For AWCA's long-term financial sustainability, she established AWCA Investment Holdings, which she leads. Cindy is positive about Africa's economic prospects and never hesitates to play the role of evangelist for entrepreneurship. 
she has invested in business in a number of sectors, including mining, financial services, technology, logistics, and industrials. But she maintains that the greatest investment is the one a society makes in its people as a widely traveled executive, Cindy always finds time to act as an ambassador for her country. And she strongly believes that South Africa is one of the best countries in which to do business. Cindy was named one of the top 20 most powerful women in business and public sector in South Africa. She was a finalist for the Business Woman uh, of the Year Awards. She is a fellow of Aspen Global Leadership Network, a member of the International Women Forum, and a member of the International Advisory Board of Upweb uh, Management School. She is a wife and a mother of two. Uh, I want to welcome Ms. Cindy to the podium as the keynote speaker. Thank you very much. Welcome keynote speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, program director. Thanks for that kind uh, introduction. Um, the leadership of the Black Management Forum led by our president, Mr. Andy Lenomlala, the family of Bradon Mkwanazi, led on our screen by Sizwe Mkwanazi. I will steal this opportunity to also recognize my former boss, former managing director and group CEO of uh, Transnet, Mafiga Mkwanazi, who's online, the past leadership of the BMF, members of the BMF, the board of the African Women CA Investment Holdings, our sponsors today, distinguished guests, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Thank you for joining me as I deliver the sixth Don Mkwanazi lecture in honor of a man who through his deeds and work has immortalized his legacy. I am so grateful to the family of Don Mkwanazi and the Black Management Forum for recognizing me as worthy to deliver a lecture that pays tribute to the great man and the legend that Don Mkwanazi was. I hope my thoughts today do justice to put Don and what he stood for. It is well known and has been said many times here tonight that Don believed that true transformation required three critical things, political freedom, economic transformation, and may I add, transformation of the mind. On political freedom, he played a key role and was unwavering in his struggle for emancipation. Those who listened to last year's lecture by Dr. Ruel Koza got an insight into his activism from Ongoye and even when they were young graduate employees meeting the ANC in exile in Zambia and in London as the president of BMF alluded earlier. When political liberation was attained, 1994 was a critical inflection point for South Africa. To all who fought for our liberation, we remain forever grateful. As we know, without that fight, we could not sit here today. Don was unrelenting in his war for economic transformation. I am reminded of his profound acceptance speech that he delivered in 2013 when the Durban University of Technology of Technology conferred an honorary doctorate on him. He poignantly said, for South Africa to realize her full potential, I'm smiling because it was said earlier, an economic revolution must take place. Economic revolution means fundamental change in economic power relations. 
It means the redefinition of economic power relations between the haves and have nots. It means your race, religion, status, where you were born must not determine your ultimate situation in life. It means equal and equitable chance of success in any endeavor of your choice in life. Economic function, no success must not be, must not correspond with race. It means fundamental deracialization of the economy. Simply put, it does not mean rearranging the chairs in the Titanic ship, but rebuilding of ship, the SA economy, I close quote. Known as the father of affirmative action, he led the advocacy for transformation and recognition of black talent in management positions in high echelons of leadership. It, is, it was this passion and commitment that made him part of the formation of this organization, BMF. He recognized that there were internal and external forces key to transform our country. The external forces includes policy, regulation, that is key to provide an enabling environment. The scraping of the Group Areas Act in 1950, the enactment of the Employment Equity Act of 1998, the Broad-Based BE Act of 2003, the Restitution of Land Rights and Reforms Act, and many other new laws that were passed post-political freedom were to ensure economic transformation as means um, to usher us into our democratic um, uh, country. Dawn was under no illusion that in addition to these enabling external factors, transforming the mind was crucial for emancipation. Don viewed education as the crucial weapon to use to lead a successful economic revolution in the country. In his own words, I quote, economic revolution must be a rapid but structured change in the economic system of a society. From a South African viewpoint, I repeat, the intention is to make every citizen share equitably in the social and economic wealth of the country. Few would challenge the proposition that human capital is fundamental to economic growth. We all know the crucial role institutions of higher learning play in the development and unleashing of full force, uh, the full force of human capital. I close quote. I fully agree with Don on the critical importance of education. Education is essential for economic liberation. Education is something that can never be taken away from you. It provides you with opportunities and options. Education is a proven lever to change lives and fortunes. Education allows someone to realize their full true potential. I could go on and on, but there may be many others who have articulated the importance of education far better than I could. Like our former president Madiba aptly captured it when he said, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. He continued to say, education is the great engine of personal development. It is through education that the daughter of a peasant can become a doctor, that the son of a mine worker can become the head of the mine that a child of farm workers can become the president of a great nation. It is what we make out of what we have, not what we are given, that separates one person from another. I, I close quote. From a humble background and forever 
humble. Don was passionate about education, a mentor to many people as he loved to share knowledge. He was a fountain of wisdom, an oracle of hope to many young people. As a young manager, he committed himself to utilizing his positions for the benefit of others in a very practical and meaningful way. I personally am forever grateful for the invaluable role that Don played in my life. It was in 1985 when I had matriculated as one of the top three students of the province of KwaZulu-Natal. This was covered in the local press. I was quite heart heartbroken at the time that I had been declined by one of the large mining houses of our country, which had a renowned bursary program. I had written an aptitude test and was informed that my results showed that I could never become a chartered accountant. I had been accepted at university to study accounting, but with no idea how I was going to finance my studies. On one of the days, I had gone to town to look for work. When I got back home, my mother told me that a stranger had come looking for me carrying the newspaper article looking for the home of Cindy Mabasu. He spent time with her understanding our family situation. He then left his details and had asked that I call him. I did the following day where the gentleman on the other side of the call had asked me several questions about my plans and told me about the Nivea bursary. The gentleman was none other than Don Mkwanasi. After a process, I secured a bursary from Nivea, a division of Smith and Nephew, where Budon was an HR manager. This enabled me to study for my BCom degree at the University of Natal Peter Maritzburg. Once a year, all the bursary students will meet, and this was to facilitate networking platform amongst us and share university challenges. This will be attended by the Smith and Nephew directors and exposed us to engaging with senior executives of the organization. Ndonga absolutely valued education and wanted to ensure that our potential was realized. Even when he went away to study at Harvard, he kept in touch with all of us encouraging and stressing the importance of working hard and attaining the goals we had. When he returned, he had a souvenir, a Harvard t-shirt for each one of us. He encouraged us to ensure that we get to Harvard at some point in our lives. I still owe him as a part of honoring him. Don became a big brother and a family friend. But Don made a very big difference in my life. I remain forever grateful. He planted the seed of paying it forward. This was the inspiration that led to the formation of the African Women CAs, where we started and by doing the same model of going back to where we came from to identify young girls who wanted to be chartered accountants. We are proud to have built a bursary that has now funded more than 100 young women studying towards the CA program and having a, a formal mentorship program. But Don was a stickler for reading. He agitated for the emancipation of the mind, as said earlier. This could never be someone else's responsibility, but your own, he used to say. Education is a critical step but more is needed. Swami Patasarathi, in his book, The Fall of the Human Intellect, talks about the intellect and self-development being an art of deep work that you do from within, as opposed to intelligence, which is about acquisition of knowledge and information. Intelligence is outside in. 
where intellect is about you utilizing the intelligence you've obtained, and it is about how. It entails a lot of work on self. Without this, the transformation of the mind would be very difficult. Swami makes a profound example of how in a class of engineers in Europe, only one of them, Matteo Favia, went on to design the Euro tunnel. Closer home, out of the same class of medicine, only one doctor, Dr. Chris Bernard, went on to do a heart transplant. What makes the difference? Swami laments that humans only utilize a fraction of their brains. If humans would utilize optimally the God-given gift of our brains, humanity will be ahead and the world will be a better place to live in, not just for a few, but for all. When a human being invests in self-awareness, realizing that who we are transcends what we are. When we start questioning our purpose and the cause for existence, this is usually a key inflection point in anyone's life. But Don alongside his friend, the former president Tabombeki, identified early in our democracy, the importance of the transformation of the mind. The concept of the African Renaissance was that the African people shall overcome challenges confronting the continent and achieve scientific, economic, and cultural renewal themselves. The concept was, was first articulated by Cheikh Anta Diop, a Senegalese politician between 1946 and 1960. Our president Mpegi made it popular as he believed that the African Renaissance played a key role in the post-apartheid intellectual agenda. It was about taking pride in our Africanness. African Renaissance is about pride. It's about respect, showing up fully, and on time for one another. I do not own the notion of lateness as African time. This is not an African narrative. My grandmother, Eshowe, would wake me up three hours before the bus time. If you were Shesha Uhamba was six, you had to be at the bus stop at 5.30 a.m. It is other things that have contributed to us shifting away from our culture and norms. We adopted other ways of life and we let go of our core being of who we are. The African Renaissance was about reinstilling the discipline. It was about raising the bar for ourselves. It was about pushing hard to, tra to transform ourselves as our president said that it's not about pointing fingers, but about how we also show up as much as we also expect other people to do the transformation. Those who are students of self-development will know how hard it is to work on self. Dealing with deep-seated and internalized pain, hurt, scars, bruises, self-doubt, lack of self-worth, messages of not good enough ringing in your heart and head, need you and only you to shake it off. No one can do the hard work for you. When you understand that the opening of a door is not enough, but it is you who must then take the next step to walk in. If you do not empower yourself to walk in, the open door is meaningless. This point of self-realization is a key inflection point in one's life. Abram Maslow, through his famed hierarchy of needs um, with his pyramid, 
others that self-actualization has everything to do with the realization for your full potential. Bhutan was a key figure in our post-apartheid intellectual agenda. He was the epitome of black intelligentsia. He instilled in us the mentality not to see ourselves as the victims of our past, but the heroes of our future. The formation of BMF was a platform to share support for one another, where as black managers, key to demanding our recognition was us doing our work with excellence such that it is a no brainer to ask why a black professional is not given their rightful place. Alongside the fight for transformation, let our work speak for itself. Ladies and gentlemen, I deliver this lecture today against a backdrop that is both familiar and unfamiliar. We have a former president who has been jailed, a first for South Africa. We have just witnessed unprecedented scenes of unrest, violence and looting, which has shaken the foundations of democratic South Africa. Some of you may have even been victims of such violence. Parts of Durban, which is Don's hometown, are in ruins in the aftermath of the unrest characterized by destruction, burning of property, infrastructure, looting, and violence. In terms of damage in the Eteguini region only, there was at least 1 billion loss of stock, 15 billion rand of damage of property and equipment, 55,000 informal traders affected, 40,000 formal businesses adversely impacted. A large portion is said to face real possibility of being unable to recover. 130,000 jobs are at risk. A portion of this may be lost for good. Total impact of the loss in the region is estimated around 50 billion, billion rand, and 30% of affected business is undecided if they will resume operations. And of course, as if the events of the last 18 months were not enough, COVID-19 pandemic has completely unpended the life as we knew it. Tragically, these two developments occurred against a backdrop that has become all too familiar to South Africans over the last 10 years or so. The inequality gap has widened. Joblessness and desperation has increased. Youth unemployment stands at over 50%. An economy that isn't growing and in some instances shrinking. All the gains that we made in the first 10 to 15 years of democracy seem to have been eroded. 27 years after democracy, our poor have seen how our leadership that they thought was representative of the demographics of our country and understood their plight has let them down. State resources looted, and a country engulfed in corruption. That South Africa is in a very tight spot, I think a few of us can or will dispute. It may be the darkest time that South Africa has ever endured since 1994. It is clear that the events of the last two weeks are an inflection point. At the Duke Davos of Human Capital 2021, Rita McGrath, a strategic expert, unpacked what it is to be at a strategic inflection point. I quote, it is an inevitable point at a time of challenge. If you get it right, it takes you to new heights. If you get it wrong, you go downhill. The critical thing about an inflection point is it's this or that. Staying steady is not an option. 
I close quote. She continues to say, inflection points feel as if they just happen instantly. Yet when you look at them, they would have been in the making for a long time, like the Ernest Hemingway line, in the sun also rises, where a character asks, how did you get bankrupt? The answer was two ways. First, it was gradual, then suddenly, a close quote. In South African parlance, it's simply called crossroads. We have to decide which direction we are going to take. Unless we change, um, if we don't change our trajectory, the center is not going to hold. It is not holding anymore. We have brought ourselves from the edge many times as South Africans. We've also showcased our excellence as a country, showing that we can. During the 2010 World Cup, in 2010, while the world was recovering from a global financial meltdown, South Africa hosted the world during the global soccer showpiece. We demonstrated as a country that there is nothing beyond our imagination and achievement. We came together across all sorts of divides to deliver world-class infrastructure and a truly memorable FIFA Soccer World Cup. Today, South Africa is confronted with another choice yet again. But Dawn would be on platforms already following the events of the last few weeks and asking, why are we here and how did we land here? He would have clearly denounced the behavior of self-destruction. We all know why people resort to self-destruction. It is when the labels of unworthiness ring strong in their heads and hearts. And when what they see in front of them builds resentment as opposed to a sense of belonging. They have nothing to lose because they have nothing. However, he would have also loudly and clearly put the spotlight on the deeper root causes. This was brewing. For years, we have been nudged about how the masses of this country live on the margins and do not participate in mainstream economy. In November, 2007, back then, Andres Tutoy and David Nevis, who at the time were deputy director and researcher respect, uh, respectively of the program for land and agrarian studies at the University of the Western Cape, wrote a paper on the second economy, a research on chronic poverty, economic marginalization and adverse incorporation in Mount Frere and Kailicha. I guess these two areas were a proxy for rural areas and townships. The paper delved into poverty and, the, and that majority of people in South Africa are trapped in a second economy, structurally disconnected from the mainstream, the first world economy. It raised the point that the process of de and deindustrialization had created a heavy reliance on a formal sector in which employment was becoming increasingly elusive and fragile. To the extent that the second economy is about the informal, sec is about the informal sector, the paper highlighted that it is an important part of the economy, which should not be the second, just because we mean secondary, but it should be seen as additional, another economy that requires developmental policies and structures, but most importantly, be integrated to the mainstream economy. Another element I found striking in that paper was a contributory factor to the rising levels of poverty at the time, lest some of us have forgotten 
the effects of HIV and AIDS pandemic, which was felt among the working age population, leaving children and adults and elders to cope with the demands of survival and the escalating care, care burden of looking after orphans and dying relatives. This made me think of the impact of COVID-19 and what it is doing with regard to um, leaving a devastating trade in our lives. While we have started to quantify its impact, it clearly continues to wreak economic havoc and, 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 and havoc in lives. And as a result, we still do not have a complete tally. A number of endeavors have ensued since the unfortunate events of the last few weeks. What is heartening is that this inflection point is felt and there is a clear clarion call for all to go to the drawing board and rebuild, but rebuild better and not to restore, but to reform. So what does rebuild look like? For example, the city of Eteguini's recovery plan is hugely premised on ensuring that everyone is truly on board. There are nine pillars to the recovery plan with building a more inclusive economy being at the heart of it. These pillars are aimed at ensuring a safe and stable environment, understanding the damage, supporting business to restart, restoring confidence to retain investment, repairing government infrastructure and services, rebuilding tourism, building social cohesion, very important, and the civic pride, rapidly responding to employment, especially among the youth, and soliciting support required from government. The importance of entrepreneurship and SMMEs to drive inclusive growth cannot be overstated. South Africa has spent too long relying on the public sector and our big corporates to absorb the majority of our graduates and the young. All that, has, it, it, that it has done, it's led to a hugely overinflated inflated public wage bill and lack of competition. We need a proper restructuring of the economy to meet the needs of the 21st century. Nurturing and promoting small business and entrepreneurship are keys to our future. It is what wealthy economies are predicated on all over the world. Take, for example, the US, one of the largest economies. The US has more than 27 million small businesses, which generate about 50% of its gross domestic product. And aside from contributions to GDP, American small businesses create jobs, spark innovation, and provide opportunities for many people including women and minorities to achieve financial success and independence. In fact, the majority of US workers first entered the business world working for small businesses. Today, half of all US adults are either self-employed or work for a small business. Similarly, in the UK, SMEs contribute a whooping 52% of Britain's private sector's overall turnover. Meanwhile, in Germany, SMEs account for six in every 10 jobs and more than half of the economic output. Conversely, here at home, according to Stats SA in 2019, small businesses only contribute 22% of business turnover, creating over 10 million jobs. A study by the Small Business Institute in 2018 showed there were only 250,000 small businesses in South Africa 
and they were responsible for only 28% of formal jobs. 56% of the country's jobs were derived from 1,000 1, employers, showing a concentration or a dependency risk. Imagine that over half of the country's jobs are dependent on just 1,000 employers. This is where the opportunity comes. We need to review the complex red tape, regulatory requirements and the tax regime that is such a feature of South African business life and which disenfranchises many SMEs. We need to provide them with cheaper access to data and to the internet and energy security. The list is long. We need to improve access to capital and world-class infrastructure. Elevating the importance of SMEs will also ensure that we bring in the informal or township economy into the mainstream. Estimated conservatively to be worth 300 billion, the township economy can be instrumental in helping South Africa recover from the effects of the COVID pandemic, as well as too many years of ineffective or corrupt management of our country. But SAA needs to change the way it looks at these economies and how it deals with the informal traders. Imagine, said one research, um, said one researcher who advocates changing the way we view informal traders in our country. Imagine if interventions for street hawkers was about how to get them, um, uh, if uh, the interventions for street hawkers that are about how to get them off the, the streets. Can you imagine if we rather put our efforts on how to keep them on the streets? and increase their business. Imagine indeed, what about instead of saying no, saying yes. The other important, uh, the other opportunity to be seized is that of rolling the digital economy um, and including townships. We've just come out of an amazing um, uh, uh, Indaba by APSIP around the township economy. Um, and there are a number of ideas that came out of there. But it is clear that government and tech organizations need to consider setting up digital labs and hubs in the townships as an opportunity to empower our youth for the skills of the future, not only for job seeking. However, the reskilling needs to incorporate enterprising skills. We need to start making it cool to consider enterprising opportunities than the linear route of going to university for degrees after school. And sometimes degrees that do not fit into the economic growth that are of the key touch points of our country. For adults, one thing that our government invested in uh, uh, that is mission critical was the adult basic education that has seen the illiteracy rate of the country drop from 19.2% in 2009 to 12.1% in 2019. This indeed needs to be intensified to speed up the upward mobility of black people in our country. It is for everyone's benefit. In addition to the digital, there are a number of economies that present huge growth opportunities for our country. These include the new green economy, the marine economy, agrarian and food security economies. The prospects are wide. These require reimagined strategies, rethinking, boldness, sacrifices, innovation, and a total mindset shift. In addition, we need political expediency, collaboration with business and civil society to be able to seize these opportunities. The Department of Trade, Industry and Competition 
has rolled out a few industry master plans to reignite trade in industries that have been identified as mission critical for our country. I personally I, uh, am honored that I have been roped into playing a role in the sugar value chain master plan as an independent chairperson of the Sugar Association of South Africa. This is where we come in as professionals and the role of the BMF that we need to play in presenting the skills that must step forward in working with all stakeholders responsible for rebuilding our economy and our economic growth. But Dawn would say, if you young people do not raise your hands, do not complain when the characters that end up representing you do not reflect what you stand for. Collaboration between state and business is inevitable as we rebuild. The state cannot eradicate poverty on its own and business can also not be given this responsibility entirely. The state needs to focus on being a capable state that runs state institutions diligently with competence. We need to redefine the profile of a, of a public servant and leaders of our state organs. Business and individuals pay taxes to ensure that public services, including security, policing, health services, education, and many state offerings are effective and effectively provided. We've had a few commissions, for example, to look into how we reform our state owned entities. I'm not sure if we've had any formal outcomes by these commissions and if we have formally adopted any of the recommendations. Even without the formal outcomes, as South Africans, we deserve organizations that are led not just by competent professionals, but by highly ethical leaders. Our compromise on the values we should hold our leaders to filters down to the citizens and the entire society ends up working with the template and the tone that has been set at the top. One thing that has always gripped me in being in the public sector, petrified of knowing that I am dealing with public monies. I'm in awe at how this does not frighten or bother some of our leaders. If we demand high standards from ourselves, it will be difficult to tolerate mediocrity. We need to see professional organizations like the BMF, BBC, I saw the president of BBC here, Mr. Sandy Lezungu, APSIP, APASA, AWCA, work with government in ensuring that the best skills are the ones given the highest order of responsibility. It is possible. How did Singapore transform itself from a rundown port to a manufacturing and financial powerhouse? We all know that this reform was attributable to Lee Kuan Yew's leadership, in particular, his effective control of corruption and the resilience, or rather, sorry, the reliance on best and brightest citizens for government instead of vice versa. It is not a mistake that the top, at the top of the 17 sustainable development goals is no poverty. When the United Nations member states adopted these goals in 2015, underpinning this was the realization that without tackling poverty and the many inequalities gripping the world, economic growth is not sustainable. This is why ESG, environment, social and governance has become a critical shareholder back there. BMF has earned its credibility as an advocate for transformation and doing business the, the ethical way for 45 years. I was wondering, Mr. President, if the BMF through its investment arm 
and you've got Jasmine Buchenpul here, who is the deputy chair of BMF Investment, that shouldn't you consider buying, even if it means one share in each of the top 100 listed entities in our stock exchange, in order to earn yourself a seat through which to be vocal at the AGMs about ESG and collaborate with other shareholder activists in transforming the economy of our country. Diversity and inclusivity in the workplace was the main pillar when Buton Mkwanazi and the founders of BMF founded the organization. Therefore, I will not bore you by regurgitating the painful stats of women and black people in positions of leadership in the corporate environment in South Africa. However, I will share with you a quote from a report by the workforce movement in South Africa. I quote, despite efforts to transform the labor market, there is an apparent pervasive and persistent preference in the appointment, in the appointment promotion and development of white and Indian populations, particularly at the top two occupational levels, I close quote. Then there is the disparity in the pay gaps by gender and race, which again, I will not bore you, but then they show that we still have a long way to go. Unfortunately, Policies like our Black Economic Empowerment or the broad-based uh, Black Economic Empowerment policies, which were aimed at transforming the economy, have had limited impact in this endeavor. We cannot expect to build our, our, our economy for growth when a significant portion of our population continues to be marginalized. Black people and women of this country want to contribute meaningfully. Ladies and gentlemen, we are at an inflection point. To honor the legacy of Budon Mkwanazi, let us all rise to the occasion. In every adversity, there is an opportunity. It is time to rebuild, rebuild better. We are running out of time. Let us all roll our sleeves now, before it is too late. I thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, keynote speaker. Cindy, you went to all the corners of this country, even in the continent. So you said mindful. Um, I've ran out of words, by the way. <laughs> um, you have touched me close to my heart. Uh, I just want also to, to say, I see the chats. Um, <clears throat> they, are, they are uploading to what you are saying. They are praising. But I just want to say, probably before you leave, um, probably success is not measured by where you are in life. However, but the obstacles you have overcome. That uh, comes from Booker, T Booker uh, Washington. So therefore, um, I, will, I will spoil your talk, I think, uh, the people who has chosen you to come and present to be a keynote speaker in commemorating Ubabu uh, Donim Kwanazi in what contribution he has done, you, 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 you the best, by the way. As a leader, as a business, uh, as a mother, as everything. Uh, I think you have touched all the corners, in fact, mm -hmm. professional, business, the person on the street, uh, government, uh, private. Uh, we really thank you from BMF 
I think we can learn much from you. And also uh, probably look like you were sharing some notes with the president, I think. So <laughs> I can see they are interlink in what you have said, but uh, uh, keep on doing the, work, the, the good work and contributing to the society. Uh, let's ensure that we, we rise to, to the occasion, we fold our sleeves, we contribute, we add value, as you say. I think you will always come back whenever we raise our hand to say, please come and teach us. Uh, you are excellent. You, you are good. Thank you very much. Uh, let me take this opportunity to go to the next speaker um, to introduce Usizwe. Uh, Mkwanazi, Ingwali Nkosi, Ushamase, who's the next speaker to talk on behalf of the family and also uh, the words from the family um, in commemorating um, this lecture for Ubabu Mkwanazi as he comes from the family. Thank you very much, Shamasa. Uh, thank you, Program Director. And uh, good evening to you, Mr. Bokang Mualefe. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. A special greeting to Sis Cindy Mabaso Goyana who just gave us a great lecture this evening. Good evening to the BMF President, Babu Andile Nomlala, BMF Deputy President, Tasmia Fredericks, uh, KZN Chairperson, uh, Farah Eli, who was our program director last year, uh, all former presidents of the BMF and all former deputy presidents of the BMF present this evening. I greet all of you. Uh, to the Nkwanazi family, we obviously in lockdown, we're obviously doing this virtually. So we all spread out. Uh, most of our family is in Durban in KZN. And I'd also like to greet the friends of the Mkwanazi family and specifically the friends of UDDP Udon Mkwanazi. Uh, all over the country. I greet all of you, you know who you are. Ladies and gentlemen, yet another virtual lecture in 2021. The BMF and the Mkwanazi family were hoping that the lecture would have taken place in Durban uh, this year. But the third wave of this pandemic did not allow us to meet in Durban. And many of us have been infected and affected by this pandemic. We also heard that a staff member of the BMF, Unobuko Sieni, passed away from COVID a few weeks ago. Our heartfelt condolences to the BMF and to Unobuko Sieni's family. I would also like to ask for a moment of silence for those who have lost family members and friends to this pandemic starting now. Thank you. Sisindi Mabaso Koyana, what a powerful lecture. I'm trying to find the appropriate words to describe your lecture this evening. And I must admit I am struggling, but maybe the few words that come to mind are powerful, authentic, inspirational, and just amazing. And 
Undong, I would be very proud. Thank you for sharing your journey and thank you for sharing your journey with Undonga. For me, as a, as a younger guy or younger than you, obviously, Cindy, I cannot remember the year, whether it was 1990 or 1991, but I do remember Ubaba at home, and I think it was 1990, Mlazi, mentioning your name, a young black lady from Mlazi who is bright, intelligent, who will become a chartered accountant in the near future. And if I'm not mistaken, I know Ubab Sizu Nasana is probably the first black guy who became a chartered accountant from Mlazi. And obviously Ubaba also went into detail to share that. I remember meeting Zulu Nasane at the University of Zululand in Mlazi when Uma was completing her studies. But I would imagine you are the first black lady from Mlazi who has qualified as a chartered accountant. If I'm mistaken, then you're probably number two, but I'm pretty sure that you are number one. And obviously, Baba was obviously a guy who would share and talk. And you obviously became a chartered accountant. I did do my research. I, I do have Scorpions, but I didn't get the information when you became a chartered accountant, but I know it's in the early 90s. And you became a chartered accountant. And for you, becoming a chartered accountant was not enough. Obviously, immediately you become a chartered accountant, you become a role model uh, for other young people, uh, especially female, especially black. If you obviously look at that time in the early 90s, and you obviously took it upon yourself that you need to do something about it. It's not enough for you to become a chartered accountant. Other young black women needed to become chartered accountants. And we obviously very much aware that through your work, through African women chartered accountants investment holdings, you've made it your job and your duty to mentor and help young black people to become chartered accountants. And we really admire that and we're really appreciative of the work that you are doing. And if I can emphasize, we need more leaders like you, Cindy, and keep up the good uh, work. Your list of accolades and achievements is endless. And our program director obviously helped us and he mentioned everything. So I'm not going to do that. But like I say, I do have my own Scorpions and there is a little bit of homework that I did. And in terms of the homework that I did, I got it from younger chartered accountants, black, one male, one female, and it goes as follows. Usi Cindy served on the audit committee of FIFA, which is obviously the global soccer body, which most people don't know. I, when I got that information, I certainly did not know that. I know that Cindy, you became a financial director, which in these days it's called a group CFO uh, at the tender age of 30 years old at Transnet, not the Transnet of today or recent years, but the Transnet of, of back in the days. And also what's important to send is that you also have many mentees and you make time for each and every one of them to ensure that you have a maximum impact on their careers. And I know in terms of uh, serving and leading, you were also recently appointed on the board of ESCOM and we don't need to go into details about ESCOM, but you were recently appointed on the board of, of ESCOM. And I suppose the, my, my Scorpions also went in a little bit of detail in sharing about you. A very easygoing person, relate, relates to person even though she has done exceptionally well in her career. So you relate with everyone. And yes, you were obviously the head of the, the audit committee of uh, FIFA. And then another person uh, that part of my Scorpions 
also Cindy, she's beautiful both on the inside and the outside. And she never takes credit for herself, but is always, uh, she never, she, sorry, she, she also respects everyone, no matter what their position in society. And amongst your mentees, uh, which is Reggie, who's an artist who's trying to, uh, to inspire the Ubuntu way of living. And the other thing that I left out from the previous mentee, that Cindy has many mentees and she makes time for each and every one of them to ensure that she has maximum impact in their careers. And I suppose mentorship is quite important. The other thing uh, that I mentioned to Cindy is that your profession of being a chartered accountant has come under scrutiny and pressure, especially two, three years ago. Uh, myself, I can disclose, I work as a private client portfolio manager, so I deal with shares. So names such as Steinoff, Marcus Uester, Anoj Singh, and many, many others come to mind. And when those people come to mind, it's unethical behavior, greed, and rape and corruption was the order of the day. They sort of use another term, accounting irregularities, but it's purely cooking the books. I did a bit of accounting, it wasn't my strong point. So Cindy, we're just very grateful to actually have you as a sponsor this evening. Um, the African Women Chartered Accountants and sort of doing my research. And it was a bit of a tough job for me to prepare for this lecture because suppose last year's lecture is also available on YouTube, but I sort of spent time on the website. And, you know, after mentioning Anoj Singh and Marcus Houston and many others who were corrupt, uh, your values speak for themselves. Uh, we lead by example, we work together, we are open and honest in our communication, we are committed to our communities, which is leadership, servant leadership. Above all, we act with integrity. And I know my wife doesn't like me mentioning a name, but we sort of have a conversation about integrity, you know, especially, you know, I've got integrity but you don't tell people that you've got integrity, they can just see, but you know, we can see from the African women, um, chartered accountants, uh, that the work that you've done obviously speaks for itself. Just also want to mention a big thank you to African women, chartered accountants, investment holdings for sponsoring uh, this evening. When we think of Ubaba, uh, and the older we got, we had the privilege to call him DDP. And my siblings and I, we still fondly refer to him as UDDP. When we think of our father and his role in the Black Management Forum, in business, in entrepreneurship, in society in general, he felt strongly about the following education empowerment, servant leadership. There's obviously no leadership without ethical leadership. We've got to obviously get that straight. He felt strongly about entrepreneurship. And what Ubaba would say about entrepreneurship would be, listen Sizwe, listen Kulu, listen Luazi, whoever he was having a conversation with, Nana or Utobile was study, education, work hard, spend five years, 10 years, get experience and start your own company. And obviously I'm, I'm disclosing, I know I spoke about books last year, but I read a book about the Stein of the, the Stellenbosch mafia. Um, and recently, I know I would mention the first friends of this world, uh, people becoming chartered accountants and people spending time and then obviously <laughs> the famous name in South Africa, Johan Rupert, who sort of did his own thing, then went back to help his dad. And lastly, Ubaba felt strongly about mentorship and support. So you, Sisindi, you tick 
all of the above boxes and your work speaks for itself. I mean, I said, Ubaba in education, he would obviously celebrate and congratulate everyone who was doing well in science, in business, in law, in any field, you know, education is very important. And I mentioned in the lecture last year that you can get a matric, but you need to study post, uh, post metric empowerment. And it was not just about black economic empowerment, but it was broad based economic empowerment and servant leadership, serving your people and obviously ethical leadership. There's no leadership without ethical leadership, entrepreneurship, starting small businesses, growing. You obviously have started your own company. And when it goes to mentorship as well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's many young stars and many people that have become chartered accountants, especially young black women because of you, but it doesn't end up with just black females. I know there's males as well. Uh, uh, so that's how, as the Mkwanaza family, we remember our dad. Education, empowerment, ethical and servant leadership, entrepreneurship, and mentorship. And maybe I'm being controversial, but allow me to be if I need to be. Our father believed in total liberation for everyone. Economic freedom plus political freedom equals total liberation. We all remember that we attained political freedom in South Africa in 1994 and economic freedom is still elusive, which means we do not have total liberation yet as South Africa. And if I may ask a question, how are we treating the current political freedom that we have now and today? So maybe these few points I have will give an answer. Poor standard of education, unequal society, unemployment, sorry, high unemployment, especially youth unemployment, unending racism and racial discrimination, corruption in the public sector and the private sector, failing state-owned entities, state capture, the list goes on and on. Is economic freedom achievable or not? Maybe Mr. President Andy Lenomlala and your Deputy President Tasnia Fredericks and the leadership of the PMF and all the members of the PMF, including myself, you may have ideas of how we can achieve economic freedom in our lifetime. I think Ndonga may have had some of ideas himself, but I will leave it in your capable hands as the PMF and the leadership. I am pausing and I am gonna ask my daughter Nikita Mkwanazi to take my seat for a few minutes and we, we carry on. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Mr. Mondle Lord Sindlovu wrote an article on the BMF twins, those being Mr. Don Mkwanazi and Mr. Lord Sindlovu, titled Transformation of Business Still Very Much on the Agenda. Even in their passing, they remain together on the BMF yearly calendar. In July, the organization hosts the annual Don Mkwanazi lecture and in August, it hosts the annual Lot Ndlovu lecture. As we have entered this season of remembrance, we must reflect on their legacy and contribution and carve out our purpose for this time. It is therefore incumbent to ask, what would the twins say about the state of the transformation today? And this is what Dr. Koza called the BMF twins. In the words of Dr. Koza, he said, 
Lot Ilovu is St. Paul of the BMF course and the Black Economic Empowerment. And Don Kwanazi is the St. Peter of the BMF course and the Black Economic Empowerment. This statement of biblical report proportions sums up the esteem in which they were held for their significant contribution made to South Africa. Uh, thank you very much, Nikita. Uh, I would also like to congratulate the Black Management Forum on the 45th uh, anniversary. And I would also like to add that if the BMF is still in existence in 45 years time from now, we would have not achieved our goals of transformation as my younger brother Umon de Lotz in Lovu said, transformation of business still very much on the agenda. Specifically to the Black Management Forum, July is slowly becoming a special month for the Mkwanazi family, although with mixed emotions, of course. It has been five years since Ubaba passed away on the 2nd of July, uh, 2016. But I'm, I am sure that I speak for all the family members when I say we really look forward to this memorial lecture when we get to hear about UDDP slash Undonga and his contribution. So to the Black Management Forum, to the leadership of the Black Management Forum, Thank you so much for honoring Undonga and his work. And I'm not throwing you in the deep end if I say the Black Management Forum will still be in existence in 50 years, in 45 years time, then would have not done our work. Uh, I must disclose Babu Andi Lenomlala, uh, Deputy President Tasmir Fredericks, the leadership of the BMF, the board. I, I am also a member of the BMF in good standing in the Midrand uh, branch. And as my daughter Nikita mentioned, uh, the BMF twins, I urge all of you to please tune in next week, Friday on the 6th of August 2021 for the annual Lot and Love annual uh, lecture um, to listen to hear what the information what will be shared about the other twin. Uh, to the PMF, we are grateful as the Mkwanazi family for, for remembering us, remembering Undonga, remembering his contribution and his work uh, in the PMF. It is truly appreciated. And like I said, I am a member of the PMF and the emails, because we live in sort of different times now of lockdown and COVID, we get a lot of webinars, meeting requests from all the branches of the BMF uh, to participate, to interact with branch members, former presidents. And we are truly grateful for giving us that opportunity. I know you also had a great lecture with Professor Lumumba uh, last year. So I would like to hand over to my other daughter uh, on the lecture on Dr. Reverend L. Chapton, which took place in March this year. Uh, I'm gonna hand over to my daughter, Zenanda Mkwanazi. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Earlier this year, US civil rights activist and founder of National Action Network, Reverend Al Sharpton delivered a lecture on behalf of the BMF in March. This lecture being, Black leaders must be agents of Black liberation. Dr. Rev Al Sharpton emphasized that empowerment does not mean the enrichment and elevation of a few, but the enrichment of all our people. He further added, we should want to be successful, to allow a more equal society for others. 
We are not looking to replace white slave masters with black slave masters. We are looking for freedom for everyone. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nikita. Thank you very much, Zenande. My apologies. My daughter's kids always confuse me. And as the Mkwanazi family, and obviously speaking on behalf of my family, in case there's something that I've left out, I have requested my siblings to share something on tonight's lecture, the BMF, the speaker, on their father. So please allow me to just share these few words quickly, then I will conclude. In the words of Oprah Winfrey, legacy is every life you have touched. Legacy is every person you have met and whose influence was felt by you. And certainly that is Ubaba's legacy. Every single life he touched helped to transform and was generous with. Thank you for me that for me is a legacy and the spirit I carry with me, if not every day, certainly on most days. Thank you, Bakulu, to the BMF, who continues to take a moment and allow us to reflect, celebrate, and honor this great man, Undonga, Nkwalienkosi, Ushamase, Ubaba. I am beyond thrilled for this evening to have the keynote by one and only Sisindi Mabaso Koyana, who's a powerhouse, a woman that executes ex so much light, but also I know how highly she speaks of Ubaba. Thank you, Sisindi. I know Ubaba is exceptionally proud of the trailblazer you are. Donim Kwanazi's footprints are forever distinct and we are never without them. Giabonga, Toby Le Tops Mkwanaz. I greet you all in the name of Jesus. A huge thank you to the Black Management Forum and the African Women Chartered Accountant Investment Holdings for contributing to honor Ubaba, Undonga Umkul. It is in my heart this evening to say we have not done justice to our forefathers who pioneered, pioneered the BMF in the tumultuous time in South Africa. We have let down the real soldiers that are needed in this country. It is time we wake up before it's too late. We need to rise now for the mercy of the Lord is upon South Africa. We need to rise, we need to do what we can in our capacity to fight for what Undonga stood for, and that was total liberation equals economic emancipation and economic freedom. This is a call from God to restore his kingdom on earth. Everything needs to go back to God, and that is the only way we live in the purpose to elevate poverty, fix socio-economic landscape of the country, and build the South Africa that will make Africa rise. Luazi Mkwanazi. Don Mkwanazi Ubaba lived a legacy before living one. You see that in this lecture, the lives he touched and us, his children, and grandchildren. He understood servant leadership and its principle of, if service is below you, leadership is above you. I am grateful to the Black Management Forum and the African Women Chartered Accountants Investment Holdings for heeding the call of honoring his legacy. At last year's lecture, I ended off by saying, Rest assured, the baton has been passed. And today, my sentiments remain the same. Even as we go through turbulent times, we are battled 
up on Ubuntu Mkwanas. Transformation is about achieving marked change in the very form of something. And the wisdom of the, script, of the scriptures reveal that it is not only from the renewal of our minds that transformation can occur. The Don Mkwanas lecture continues to be a legacy platform that challenges and facilitates the changing of minds. And for that, we are grateful. There has never been a more critical time for excellent, ethical, creative, and authentic African leaders to respond to the needs of our beautiful nation and its people. May we be ignited into action to transform in the spaces in which we hold. Tabi Sam Kwanas. That's my wife. DDP was a great storyteller. He was captivating and compelling. Whole table or a room took note of when he told the story. I personally learned a lot from DDP every time we spent time together. Nolita and Gululebo and Kwanazi. I'm about to conclude, but back to you, Sis Cindy. I just want to thank my sister Utobile Mkwanazi for, for introducing herself to you at that special wedding we all attended in the Midlands late in November 2019. We had an opportunity to catch up, chilling and chatting with you and your husband that evening, really special moments. And I know a number of, few of the people that were there are also tuning in this evening. Just a small disclosure on my side, when I was doing a bit of research in you, maybe Ubaba had mentioned it, I also went to Okwini Comprehensive High School. I was just there for one year in 1990, I was 12 and I turned 13, uh, but I just was there for a year. So you and I have something in common. And in my metric book, I wrote that I'd like to become a chartered accountant, which obviously never happened. Uh, I would like to conclude. Um, my conclusion starts like this. In 2018, when Judge Vuga Shabalala delivered the lecture. I mentioned that Tubaba was a bit of a unique guy. He wanted us as his children and his grandkids to do more than him, to achieve more than he did. Which maybe to me, I don't know, for the rest of my sibling, siblings felt like mission impossible because of what he had achieved himself. But what I would like to say this evening on behalf of my siblings and specifically myself is that Tubaba wasn't really concerned about us reaching highest levels of success, but it's also about giving back and helping others, which was servant leadership. So all my siblings, our, our spouses and those of my siblings who are still gonna get spouses, and our children and obviously known as grandkids and more grandkids is gonna have in the future. I just wanna assure you that it's not gonna be about us, about the house we live in, the area we live in, the cars we drive. That's, that's a failure. We need to help others. We need to have an impact on other people's careers, just like Usu Cindy has done in helping African ladies, especially from disadvantaged backgrounds, to become chartered accountants. So I hold you accountable to that. I'd like to be a teacher maybe when I get to age 55 in all the schools in South Africa to give back the little. So obviously it's not gonna be easy. And the reason I'm sharing this on this platform is for all of you present this evening to hold me and my siblings accountable that it's not about us, it's about our community, 
It's about our nation. It's about our continent. It's about the uh, globe at large. So I assure you that we will do our best to do that. Probably it's not going to be easy, but we will do our best every day. I would also like to thank Mr. Bokang Molefe, our program director for this evening for a job well done. Thank you very much for running this program and for your role and for your contribution. Thank you very much. To our sponsors this evening, uh, to African Women Chartered Accountants Investment Holdings and the speaker that spoke earlier, thank you very much for your generosity. Thank you very much for sponsoring the sixth Don Konazi Memorial uh, Lecture. To the Black Management Forum, again, thanks for making this evening happen and honoring Dr. Don Konazi. We as a family are truly grateful. I hope we will be together next year in Durban in person for the same lecture. And we'll invite you to Cindy to be there. We'll invite you Dr. Ruel Koza to be there and the previous uh, speakers. Special mention, I would like to thank the leadership of the BMF in KZN, led by Farah Eli. Uh, Don Mkwanazi is a son of the Durban soil, son of the soil, son of, of Durban. Thank you for, for hosting us this evening. Thank you very much. And hopefully we'll be in Durban next year. And as the president of the BMF said, we can break bread together after the lecture. I must not forget the BMF Organizing Committee, uh, Babu Felipe, uh, Phil, as I said, we can call him, and Kulu for their hard work and their organizational skills and making sure that this evening takes place. Uh, Cindy, to you as the main speaker, Siabonga Kulu for tonight. Thanks for for a great lecture. Thanks for a powerful lecture, inspiring. Thanks for your work. Thanks for your contribution. It's not only about you, but it's about it's about everyone. And I'm pretty certain that you are the first black chartered accountant, a lady from Mlazi, our our township. And I have no doubt, I know I found you earlier today that Undonga is definitely uh, proud of you. To the friends of the Mkwanazi family and to the friends of UDDP, I know there's many of Ubaba's friends I tried to reach to and to reach out. And some of his friends reached out to other friends that I couldn't reach out to. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for spending this evening with us. Thank you for being with us. Please take care and stay safe. I know we're all vaccinating and we will meet again next year in July sometime in Durban, and we will be hosted by the BMF KZN at this lecture. See you in Durban. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, thank you, Sizwa. You have said Mark Fall. Uh, so, I think you have covered everything. I uh, want to take this opportunity that you have came to the end of our lecture. Thank you by those great words. Thank you very much. Uh, be safe, take care, vaccinate. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.